All right, I think we'll make a start for timeliness's sake. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us for the, I believe, fourth in our Astini Spring Lecture Series. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Maddie Bowden. I'm the reviews editor on the Astini Committee. Uh, and it gives me great pleasure this evening uh, to introduce our next lecture in this series, which comes from our chair, Professor Paul Starkey. I'll uh, give him a brief introduction. Uh, chair, uh, yes, Paul is the chair of Astini and the professor emeritus at the University of Durham. Um, Paul has been an active leader across a number of Middle Eastern studies organizations, including as vice president of Brismas, co-director of the Center for Advanced Study of the Arab World, director of the Institute for Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies, and the head of the Arabic department, both of those at Durham University. Paul is best known as a translator and has published translations of many works in modern Arabic literature, including novels by Edouard Al-Karet, Mansura Ez Eldin, Yusuf Raka and Mustafa Khalifa. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce his paper this evening, um, which is titled Visiting the Cedars of Lebanon from Gilgamesh to Edward Lear and beyond. And I forgot to do my little bit of housekeeping. Sorry about that, Paul. Um, but just to say, uh, we'll save questions till the end. Please use the chat function um, during the talk if you'd like to record your questions there. And we'll come back to them at the end of the session for a Q&A. But yes, again, let me introduce Paul's paper and hand it over to him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maddie, and good evening uh, to everybody. Uh, paper is entitled Visiting the Cedars of Lebanon from Gilgamesh to Edward Lear and Beyond. Uh, the words and beyond seem to have dropped off the title uh, at some stage in the process, um, but we're not going to stop at Edward Lear. Um, we'll go on a bit beyond him. So let's go straight into it. See the tablet box of cedar, release its clasp of bronze, lift the lid of its secret, pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli and read out the travails of Gilgamesh, all that he went through. So begins the epic of Gilgamesh, a narrative that has some claim to be the first great masterpiece of world literature, as it's been called, whose origins almost certainly go back to the third millennium BC and which has come down to us in a number of different versions from several different periods and in several different languages. Though in what we may call the standard version, it was written in cuneiform script on clay tablets in Akkadian, a Semitic language now extinct related to Hebrew and Arabic. Variously interpreted as an epic motivated by the fear of death as a debate on the proper duties of kingship or the eternal conflict of nature and nurture, the story also incorporates a version of the story of the great flood and a long narrative of the gloomy realm of the dead, from all of which the hero Gilgamesh emerges as a kind of early Mesopotamian Superman. What concerns us in particular this evening, however, is the fact that in addition to all his other heroic adventures, the Gilgamesh who emerges from the tablet box of cedar can be regarded as perhaps the first recorded visitor to the cedars of Mount Lebanon, a natural botanical phenomenon that has served despite the increasingly precarious status of Kedros Libani, to give it its botanical name, for thousands of years as a distinctive artistic and cultural icon recognizable far beyond the Middle East itself. The epic relates how Gilgamesh, in a search for fame and glory, and ignoring the warnings of his friend and companion Enkidu about the dangers, proposes an expedition to the forest of Cedar, which is guarded by the monstrous Humbaba, appointed to protect its timbers. After making preparations for their journey and consulting his goddess mother, the pair embark on their trip, reach the forest and confront Humbaba. I quote, they stood there marveling at the forest, gazing at the lofty cedars, gazing at forest's entrance, 
where Humbaba came and went, there was a track. The path was straight and the way well trodden. They saw the mountain of cedar, seat of gods and goddesses throne. On the face of the mountain, the cedar proffered its abundance. Its shade was sweet and full of delight. After admiring the cedar forests, our heroes quickly move on to action. Gilgamesh and Humbaba fight. Shamash, the sun god, whose name betrays his Semitic connections, sends 13 winds to blind Humbaba, and encouraged by his friend Enkidu, Gilgamesh slays Humbaba. He slew the ogre, the forest guardian, at whose yell were sundered the peaks of Syrian and Lebanon. The mountains did quake and the hillsides did tremble. And a little later, he went down to trample the forest. He discovered the secret abodes of the gods, Gilgamesh felling the trees, Enkidu choosing the timber. Although damage to the tablets makes the reconstruction of the narrative somewhat problematical at this point, in a better preserved version, Gilgamesh is instructed by his friends to lay low the forest of cedar and to seek out a lofty tree whose crown is high as the heavens in order to construct a door of a reed length's breadth whose side will be a cubit to be floated down the Euphrates for the folk of Nippur to rejoice over it and the god Enlil to delight in it. And so, they bound together a raft. They laid the cedar on it. Enkidu was helmsman and Gilgamesh carried the head of Humbaba. End of quote. There are some geographical and botanical complications attaching to this account. The first is that the precise geography of much of the action is uncertain, not to say fluid. Early translators for the epic assumed that the forest in question referred to the area currently associated with the cedars of Lebanon. Uh, but in other versions, the forest lay towards the sunrise, i.e. to the east in Iran. Possibly among, along the western foothills of the Zagros Mountains, where Kedros Libani has never actually been found. Other times in the other places, the Cedar Mountain can be found or placed in south central Turkey. So geographical confusion in different versions, probably reflecting the fact that at the time of composition and transmission of the various versions of the Epic of Gilgamesh, far more of the mountains of the Middle East were forested than at present. Uh, if you look at a map of where you can find Kedros Libani today, uh, you've got um, uh, the main uh, sites are in, in Lebanon, but also southern Turkey, uh, Cyprus and the north, extreme northwest of Syria. Uh, and then if you look at a more detailed map of, of more detailed sites, you can see uh, it, it's a very small, limited number of lo locations that we're talking about. So there's geographical confusion. The second and related point to be made is that although the cedar forest is most often assumed to refer to the forests of Kedros Libani. This is not always the case necessarily. The word conventionally translated as cedar in the context of the Epic of Gilgamesh is Sumerian Eren, Akkadian Erenum, but this is some elsewhere sometimes translated as pine. And to quote the translator, uh, George, I quote, I suspect modern taxonomy is not an exact fit on the old, and that Arenum can refer to any large evergreen timber yielding tree. In Lebanon, it would be the famous indigenous cedar, but in the Zagros, that's in Iran, may be another species. A similar health warning about the dangers of attempting to graft modern taxonomies onto pre-modern texts is also relevant to some pre-modern Arabic and Hebrew texts relating to the cedar, though there is no time to discuss that here. What seems certain is that already at this early date, we can observe an intriguing combination of ways of looking at the cedar, whose wood is already being used 
not only for tablet boxes, but also for massive doors. And his forests are not only sites of religious significance and heroic conflict, but also places of natural beauty with shade that is sweet and full of delight. What seems both slightly shocking as well as perhaps prophetic in the everyday rather than the religious sense of the word is that the hero of the epic concludes this stage in his adventures by chopping down the biggest tree he can find and sailing off with it down the Euphrates in order to use it for making a door back home. In this sense, Gilgamesh's exploits could almost be seen as a template for the way in which subsequent visitors to the region have treated its natural resources. After Gilgamesh, the next important references to cedars are to be found in the books of the Old Testament, where cedars, singular or plural, are mentioned, depending on precisely how you count them, approximately 75 times. The Old Testament references share with Gilgamesh the characteristic that they combine a functional view of the tree with other references that treat it in a more symbolic manner. Unlike the Epic of Gilgamesh, however, where the cedar forests form an integral part of the setting for one of Gilgamesh's major exploits, references to the cedars in the Old Testament are usually comparatively brief. Three main categories can be identified. First, brief references to the use of cedar wood as part of religious ritual. Second, factual references to cedars as a building material, as at the conclusion of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And third, references to cedars in a more abstract, less functional manner, for example, as part of a metaphor or simile, or as being associated with particular qualities. Two points are worth making here. The first to reiterate the point that as with the Epic of Gilgamesh, while we can generally assume that the Hebrew word Erez, translated almost universally as cedar in English translations of the Old Testament, refers specifically to Kedros Libani. And although the Old Testament texts are generally free of the geographical ambiguities associated with Gilgamesh, we cannot in all instances be certain that the term Erez is being used so specifically. The second is to note that although the more immediate etymology of the English word cedar appears straightforward, being derived from Old French sed, from Latin kedros and from ancient Greek kedros, the original meaning of the root has been the subject of some speculation. Uh, the speculation to connect the, the European and the Hebrew uh, roots together, but we'll spare you any more details about it. It quickly becomes uh, a little technical to say the least. Probably better known than the references to the ritual use of cedars, in the Old Testament are the references to cedar as a construction material. In particular, for the construction of the house built for David and for the building of the Temple of Solomon, the supply of cedars for which was apparently arranged by Hiram of Tyre and the dimensions of which are described in rather precise terms. Now therefore command thou that they hew me cedar trees out of Lebanon. Uh, I'm quoting uh, from Kings. We'll, we'll skip a bit and, and skip to the, the end of this um, passage. It's quite an extended passage. Uh, but it goes on. So Hiram gave Solomon cedar trees and fir trees according to all his desire. So he built the house and finished it and covered the house with beams and boards of cedar. And he built the inner court with three rows of huge stone and a row of cedar beams. He built also the house of the forest of Lebanon. The length thereof was an hundred cubits, and the breadth thereof fifty cubits, and the height thereof thirty cubits, upon four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams upon the pillars. Among the third category of references, similes, metaphors and the like, which not infrequently alludes to the cedar tree's height, fruitfulness and strength, we may instance the well-known verse, I quote, the righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon, as well as 
quote again, he moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together, end of quote, in which the precise nature of the comparison being made is a good deal less clear. In two chronicles, two plants, thistle and cedar, are used as metaphors for a weak and a strong man, respectively, I quote. And Joash, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, the thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle, end of quote. Well, again, we could give numerous more examples. I noted that there were 75 uh, references to cedars uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, we don't want to go through them for it all. We want to get on, I think, for uh, some other travellers. What is clear is that the cedar forests of Mount Lebanon held attractions for outsiders as hunting grounds, as well as sources of timber. And the Israelites were far from being the only people to have contributed to their decline in ancient times. The ancient Egyptians used cedars extensively for various purposes, the wood itself being transported to Egypt by sea from the port of Byblos, modern Jubail, just north of modern, Be modern Beirut. Further east, the Assyrians also used cedars for, among other things, temple construction, while the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar recorded that, I quote, I cleft the high mountains, I cut blocks of stone from the mountains, I opened paths, prepared roads for the transport of the cedars. On the canal of Achtu, as though they were reeds of the river, I floated yard, large cedars, tall and strong, of great beauty, of imposing aspect, rich products of Lebanon. Cedars were also used extensively, both by the Greeks and the Romans. Intriguingly, it appears that already by the second century AD, notice was being taken of the diminishing area being occupied by the forest. Attempts were made to curb their use in the interests of, confirmation, of conservation. And in AD 138, the Emperor Hadrian had the boundaries of the imperial forests marked by stones, bearing inscriptions in Latin, in an attempt to define the boundaries of the forests and control felling. Two of the stones are on display in the American University of Beirut, which you can see here. There are no references, so far as I can tell, to the cedar. Uh, in the New Testament, but from an early date, a tradition seems to have emerged that Christ's cross was constructed of either three or four different types of wood, which appear in different combinations in different accounts and different writers. The fictitious travel traveller, Sir John Mandeville, for example, uh, discussed by Janet last week, and whose work dates from the 14th century, asserts that Jesus's cross is to be found at Constantinople and lists the four woods of which it is composed as being palm, cedar, cypress and olive, explaining that they made the foot of cedar, they made the foot of the cross that is of cedar, for cedar may not in the earth nor in water rot. There are no references to cedars in the Quran either. Though we do find a rather enigmatic reference to cedars in a hadith, one of the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that for Muslims supplement the words of the Quran itself. Abu Huraira said, I quote, the messenger of God said, the example of the believer is like that of a plant which is continually bent over by the wind. The believer is continually beset with affliction. The example of a hypocrite is like that of the cedar tree, which does not yield until it is uprooted in one go. Well, that's one translation. If you look on the screen, you'll see the parable of the hypocrite is that of a cedar tree, 
it does not give in until it is cut down, which is slightly different. Uh, whichever you favour, uh, well, various interpretations can be found on Muslim websites and other places, not all of which seem totally convincing. What does seem clear is that the Old Testament equation of the cedar with the best and the noblest and the strongest seems here to have been turned on its head. For what reason I have been completely unable to discover. It seems rather curious that although cedars are not unnaturally frequently mentioned in medieval descriptions of buildings in which their timber, timber was used, they do not appear to have attracted much attention in their native habitat from the best known travellers during the period. Ibn Battuta, for example, probably the most famous of the medieval Arab travellers, travelled in the area, but notes simply that, I quote, I went on from there to the mountains of Lebanon. These are among the most fertile mountains on earth, with all sorts of fruits and springs of water and shaded culverts, end of quote. Two centuries earlier, the Jewish rabbi Benjamin of Tudela had likewise passed through the area, but although he mentions Mount Lebanon a couple of times in passing, he says nothing of interest either about the mountain or about the cedars. Nor does Marco Polo, who again travelled in the region. Both travellers were apparently more interested in the phenomenon of the assassins and the old man of the mountain than in cedar trees. As time went on, however, interest in the cedars among travellers grew. The fictitious traveller, uh, Sir John Mandeville, who travelled about 1357, or supposedly travelled, 1357 to 1371, whom we've already mentioned, noted in relation to the cedars of Lebanon, I quote, the mountains of Lebanon stretch to the desert of Faran, separating the kingdom of Syria and the country of Phoenicia. On these hills, very tall cedars grow and they bear long apples, which are as big as a man's head. Well, that's a typical Mandeville uh, a sort of statement, exaggeration, complete fantasy, as anybody can see. It's not until the 16th century, however, that we begin to find reasonably accurate accounts by travellers from Europe of the cedars. The oldest being that by the French traveller Pierre Bellon, who travelled or lived rather 1517 to 1564, who travelled to the Lebanese mountains around 1550 and gives us what appears to be the first modern description of the cedars at Bashari, which is the main site to in the north of Lebanon, including an estimate of their number, I quote a little, at a considerable height up the mountains, the traveller arrives at the Monastery of the Virgin Mary, which is situated in the valley. Thence proceeding four miles up the mountain, he will arrive at the cedars, the Maronites or the monks acting as guides. The cedars stand in a valley and not on the top of the mountains, and they are supposed to amount to 28 in number, though it is difficult to count them, they being distant from each other a few paces. That sounds a bit feeble, really. Um, these the Archbishop of Damascus has endeavoured to prove to be the same that Solomon planted with his own hands, etc., etc. Uh, you get the general gist uh, of his description. Writing in 1844, commentator John Ludon comments that around that period, paying a visit to the cedars of Mount Lebanon seems to have been considered a sort of pilgrimage and notes that the patriarch of the Maronites, I quote, fearing that the trees would be destroyed, threatened excommunication to all those who should injure the cedars, end of quote. Another example of the awareness of the need for conservation predating modern times. Bellon's excursion to the Cedars was quickly followed by others, including the German Leonhard Raulwolf, 1535-96, who counted 26 trees, but more importantly left one of the first attempts at a more precise description of the trees themselves, some of which he notes, I quote, 
King Solomon ordered to be cut down to be employed for the use of the building of the Temple of Jerusalem. A commentator has noted that Ralph's detail was remarkable. I quote, especially when one considers that in the 16th century, there was no tradition of writing botanical handbooks, floras as we know them, and the publication of herbals was only just resuming after a break of more than a thousand years. I'll quote a few sentences of, of Ralph's uh, description. Uh, these trees are green all the year long, have strong stems that are several fathoms about and are as high as our fir trees. They have very large twigs that bend the tree and make it lean that way, which somewhat spoileth their straightness. Branches grow up straight as also to the cones thereof, which are large and round and extend themselves a great length in so delicate and pleasant order and evenness as if they are trimmed and made even with a great deal of diligence. Well, it's quite a far cry uh, from Mandeville's description of uh, whatever it was, fruit as big as men's heads. From this time on, the number of visitors and accounts begins to multiply rapidly. A selection compiled by the late Niger, Nigel Hepper in 2001 lists, among others, the Reverend Henry Mundrell, Richard Pocock, Jean de Thévenot, Volney, J. L. Burkhart, James Silk Buckingham, William John Banks, Charles Merrion, who was Lady Hester Stanhope's doctor, the Austrian Ida Pfeiffer, Pliny Fisk and Jonah King, who are early American Protestant missionaries in the region, Richard Burton, who visited the Cedars in 1870, and several more. Some of those uh, names will be more familiar, obviously, than others. That's just a selection from Hepper's list, uh, which Hepper himself describes as a selection. Uh, it's not unfair to say that once one has read three or four of these guys' accounts, and they all are guys, uh, uh, three or four of these accounts of the cedars, they quickly begin to form. Almost everybody, of course, had to estimate the number of cedars to be seen, and the numbers vary considerably, depending, among other things, on precisely what the traveller in question thought he was supposed to be counting. As the American missionary Pliny Fisk wrote in the 19th century, I quote, I know not why travellers have so long and so generally given 28, 20, 15 or 5 as the number of cedars. It is true that of those of superior size and antiquity there are not a great number, but then there is a regular gradation in size from the largest down to the, to the merest sapling. Fisk himself counted 389 trees, while his companion and fellow missionary Jonas King counted 321 plus saplings. Uh, well, there's a pretty big difference between the 300 plus and the 26 or 28 of some of the earlier travellers. It just depends what you're, I think, trying to count. A few other general remarks. First, we may note that up until the 19th century, almost all travellers' descriptions were of the group of cedars at Bashari in northern Lebanon, though there were and are also groups in the Shouf in southeast of Beirut and elsewhere. Uh, and we saw that on the map that we had up earlier. Secondly, in addition to counting the trees, many travellers tried to measure their size. It was common, of course, to remark on their biblical associations, particularly the link with the Temple of Solomon, and a number of travellers were conscious that what they were seeing was a natural phenomenon that had lost at least part of its former glory. Even Ralwolf, who travelled in the 16th century, noted that, I quote, this hill hath in former ages been quite covered with cedars, yet they are since so decreased, and adds, I also went about this place to look for young ones, but could find none at all, end of quote. Some visitors got lost because of the weather, including the clergyman Henry Maundrell, 
who visited in 1697 and was caught in a storm with a rather unsatisfactory guide and who rambled about for several hours, as he described it, before eventually arriving at the way that leads down to Cunnabin after a long exercise of pains and patience. Some visitors were also distinctively unimpressed. Charles Merrion, Lady Hester Stanhope's doctor, who visited in 1815, having first noted that the cedars, I quote, have been too often described to render it necessary to say anything about them, end of quote, went on to opine that, I quote again, these cedars have a very dubious reputation and no beauty to recommend them, and suggested that those that grow in the grounds of Warwick Castle, as you see here, are almost equally worth seeing. The ever cynical Richard Burton, who visited in 1870, somewhat later, wrote, I quote, I fear it will be considered bad taste to confess that none of us fell into the usual ecstasies before these exaggerated Christmas trees, which look from afar like the corner of a fir plantation, and which, when near, prove so mean and ragged that an English country gentleman would refuse them admittance to his park. Indeed, many a churchyard at home has yews which surpass Ars Lebanon in appearance and which are probably of older date. As a rule, cedars of the Lab Libanus are badly clad, ill-conditioned and homely growth, essentially unpicturesque, except perhaps when viewed from above. Burton himself draws attention to the varying numbers given by previous travellers, as well as their varying descriptions, and quotes the opinion of a Mr. B.T. Lown to the effect that, I quote, the cedars of the Libanus moraines and the papyrus of the Jordan are traces of the two ancient and almost extinct floras descending from old geological periods. End of quote. Unable to praise the cedars, he he concedes that their location affords the only tolerable mountain view hitherto seen in the Libanus, and relates how, I quote, I was fortunate enough to secure sundry of the small valueless cones, which are used chiefly as charcoal for application to wounds. But who will absolve me from the sacrilege of carrying off a large block as a present for my cousin B. Protestant writers are very severe upon this point. The cedars of Lebanon, we are told, are not merely interesting and venerable, they are sacred. And deliberately to use knife or saw is an act that would disgrace a Bedouin. Yet the same writer in another place assures us that Christianity is not a religion of holy places, and if so, we may be certain that it utterly neglects holy trees." End of quote. Burton's reference to collecting cones and the comparisons made between the cedars growing in their natural Lebanese habitat and others at home in Britain are reminders that by this time several botanists and travellers had taken seeds back home with them and from the 17th century, we find cedars of Lebanon growing in gardens in the British Isles. That's a rather nice uh, picture, which is uh, of Dujusia's cedar of Lebanon. It's being transported. This isn't being transported from Lebanon. It's actually being transported from England to France. Um, the French are eager to get hold of um, uh, specimens uh, came to England to take them off, take them away. Cedars planted at Chelsea in 1683 after its gardener John Watts brought back specimens from Holland, again uh, uh, specimens being traded around Europe, uh, were the first in English, England to produce seeds in 1732. And drawings made at the Chelsea Physic Garden 
was subsequently sent to Nuremberg for engraving and publication. By this time, some visitors had begun to develop bad habits, most notably the propensity of so-called Orientalist travellers to carve their names on the trees. Viscount Castlereagh, who visited in 1846, noted the names of Laborde, Burkhart, Lamartine, with several others, while an American John Ross Brown, who travelled around the same time, noted that, I quote, all the old trees and many of the younger ones have large pieces cut out of their trunks upon which are carved the names of visitors who from time to time have been attracted to this remote region. Among these, I noticed the name of Lamartine, said to have been carved by an Arab, while the great sentimentalist was going into ecstasies in his comfortable quarters below. There were several American names, but none of very recent date, only two within two years. <coughs> in the register, which is kept on the altar of the chapel, I saw several English, French and Oriental names. Some of the remarks were curious enough. One gentleman who probably imagined the cedars to be yellow or pink with crimson tops like those in the panorama, says he visited the cedars of Lebanon and was greatly disappointed. Another traveller states that he could see much larger and finer trees at home without trouble or expense. This is a continuing theme, as you will have gathered. John Ross Brown's reference to a panorama, though curious, is apposite, for by this time the trees had also begun to attract the attention of painters, later photographers, travelling in the region, and a number of well-known artists have left us examples of their work from their travels in the area. Probably the most famous being Edward Lear, who travelled in the area in 1858, and whose reaction to the cedars could hardly have formed a greater contrast with that of Burton. I quote from Lear. I cannot tell you how delighted I was with these cedars. These enormous old trees, a great dark grove, utterly silent except the singing of birds in numbers. Here I stayed all that day, the 20th, and all the 21st working very hard. Only that there was a little drawback to my pet cedars, and that was that, being 6,000 feet above the sea and surrounded by high snow peaks, the cold was so great I could not hold my pencil well. The genesis of Lear's famous The Cedars of Lebanon, signed and dated 1861, is both an interesting and a complex one. Impressed as he was by the cedars in situ, Lear lacked the time to work up his sketches into a finished picture, perhaps because his fingers were too cold. So to complete his task, he sought out suitable specimens on his return to England finding what he needed to complete his picture on the estate of the Oaklands Park Hotel in North Surrey, where one of the trees now bears the inscription, I quote, this is one of the first cedars of Lebanon imported into England. It is believed to have been planted here by Prince Henry Oaklands, the youngest, youngest son of King Charles I, end of quote. Lear's The Cedars of Lebanon, which exists in various versions, was not favourably received when it was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1862, prompting a characteristic outburst from the artist, I quote. Sometimes I consider as to the wit of taking my cedars out of its frame and putting it on the border of coloured velvet, embellished with a fringe of yellow, worsted with black spots, to protify the possible proximate propinquity of predatorial panthers, and then selling the whole for floor cloth by auction." End of quote. Despite this initial lack of appreciation, however, Lear's picture remains arguably 
one of the most iconic and effective representations of the tree. And that's that's the trees that um, Oatlands were, which were apparently used by uh, Lear to, to finish his picture. Other artist travellers who took the tree cedars as subjects, either as a, as a result of visiting the area in person or at second hand, include W. H. Bartlett, seen here. Another scene in Mount Lebanon after, after uh, Bartlett in this case. J.D. Harding, The Cedars of Lebanon, 1840. These are all a bit earlier than Leo, in fact. And J.M.W. Turner, The Cedars of Lebanon. Then anonymous English school, The Cedars of Lebanon. There are endless uh, representations as you can see from around this period, and another one of 1860, Mount Lebanon with uh, the Cedars. The biblical associations of the Cedars also prompted a mushrooming of cedar imagery in illustrated editions of the Bible, not to mention at least one Christmas carol. The cedar of Lebanon, plant of renown, hath bowed to the hiss of his wide spreading crown. The son of the highest an infant is laid on the breast of his mother, the name is made, etc., etc. Uh, you get the general gist. Uh, sorry, we've gone the wrong way. We've come to the end, which we didn't want to do. <clears throat> This is not the only manifestation of the cedars in verse from around this period either. In uh, Breckenridge's quite dreadful poem entitled The Judgment of Solomon, published in 1846, the cedars are even personified uh, to such an extent that they actually speak. I quote, all that tent, the lofty cedars, gnarled and knotted, huge and old, whispered ever in the breezes and a tale of wonders told. List ye nations, cried the cedars, for beneath our arms outspread, lo, the wisest of earth's monarchs, now he rests his youthful head. The cedars have also served as inspiration for many more modern artistic representations. And one of my favorites, is by the tortured, I use the word uh, quotation, uh, Hungarian artist Tivadar Csontvári Koska, lived from 1853 to 1919, the father of Hungarian modernism, who from 1890 travelled around the world visiting Lebanon as well as other countries of the Middle East and painted a number of pictures based on the cedar uh, on his return. Uh, these, to my mind, are um, quite delightful representations. Uh, there were several, there were two or three, that's one with himself in the picture as well. And nowadays, of course, one can find any number of representations of the trees photos, paintings, or whatever, on the web uh, in any number of styles. Meanwhile, through the 19th century, the cedars were beginning to acquire symbolic importance among the Lebanese themselves, not least among Lebanese exiles, as a symbol of the homeland they had left behind, often as a result of intercommunal strife. Uh, and whose experience of Lebanon, their homeland, uh, was often, or not infrequently, uh, only as travellers uh, themselves, uh, rather than um, uh, locals, as it were. The best known of these exiles to Western readers is undoubtedly Gibran, Khalil Gibran, author of The Prophet, a source of endless romantic quotations, weddings and other such events, 
who despite spending most of his adult life in the US and writing most of his mature works in English rather than Arabic, never ceased to retain a deeply felt mystical attraction for his homeland. Quote, Spring is beautiful everywhere, but it is most beautiful in Lebanon. It is a spirit that roams round the earth but hovers over Lebanon, conversing with kings and prophets, singing with the rivers the songs of Solomon, and repeating with the holy cedars of Lebanon the memory of ancient glory. Beirut, free from the mud of winter and the dust of summer, is like a bride in the spring, or like a mermaid sitting by the side of a brook, drying her mouth, drying her smooth skin in the rays of the sun, etc., etc. That's a rather roman over, unlikely romanticised view of Beirut uh, at the moment, but this is um, uh, quite typical of Lebanese, exiled Lebanese expressions of love for their homeland and uh, a land which they often or uh, sometimes only experience as travellers themselves. In this sort of passage, Gibran's refer references to the cedars exude a sort of sickly romanticism, which curiously seems to permeate even those critics who write about him. Take, for example, the following extract from a well-respected biography of Gibran by Suhail Bushri and Joe Jenkins. These are respected scholars. How, uh, I quote, among the cliffs, gorges and groves, drenched with the incense of the cedar forests, the boy reduced in the, uh, rejoiced in the sounds and silence of nature. Like the mountain itself, the sacred groves of the cedars are a symbol of life. Since ancient times, their shadows have fallen on the profusion of cultures that have enriched Lebanon. The hardy trees were used by the pharaohs of ancient Egypt to furnish their tombs by King Solomon in the building of his great temple in, Jerus in Jerusalem and by the Phoenicians in the building of their mighty boats, which brought such gifts as the phonetic alphabet to the road, etc. 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 Well, I mean, the most of the facts are, are quite correct, um, but the tone in which it's written is really quite extraordinary for what purports to be a, a scholarly book. With the cedar assuming such a position as a national symbol, it's not therefore surprising to find that it appeared on the Lebanese flag, initially from, 18, from 1918 as a simple green cedar, later during the French mandate period, from 1920 to 1943, in conjunction with the French tricolor. The present Israeli uh, Lebanese flag, in the form with which we are all familiar with it, dates from 1943, and the colours, as is usual in such contexts, have been assigned symbolic interpretations. White represents purity, green life, fertility, and red the blood of the martyrs who died seeking independence from the Ottoman Turks, or later the French. At a national level, the cedar has also appeared on many postage stamps, as well as on coins and notes, on the Lebanese passport, and in countless other varied contexts. As a botanical icon, we may note its appearance on the Hope Medal, a medal awarded annually by the Scottish physician and botanist John Hope, Professor of Botany in the University of Edinburgh, who lived from 1725 to 1786, and as a more modern uh, in, uh, artistic interpretation, we may note the work of the local sculptor Rudi Rahme, himself born in Bishari, who has used dead cedar trees to create a monumental sculpture, the Lamartine tree, said to be the largest vegetal sculpture in the world at 32 metres in height. I conclude with a couple of images of the cedars in unlikely places. When, following the catastrophic explosion in the port of Beirut last August, other countries expressed their solidarity with the Lebanese. Here is Giza uh, outside Cairo. And perhaps the least likely place of all, 
Tel Aviv, Israel, where the Lebanese flag was briefly projected onto the city's town hall, the mayor declaring that, I quote, humanity comes before any conflict and our hearts are with the Lebanese people following this terrible disaster, end of quote. This being the Middle East, of course, it wasn't that simple. Right, the Israelis railed against the gesture and some Arabs also questioned whether they really needed Israeli solidarity. That is another story uh, and certainly not one for Astini. For the moment, I suggest we can simply express the hope that while there are for obvious reasons there have been fewer visitors to the cedars of Lebanon last year and this than usual, they will soon resume their status as a tour, as a draw for tourists and visitors to the country and that a new generation of travellers will emerge to add their impressions in words and pictures to the accounts of the area that we have been reviewing tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Uh, I'm sure we're all virtually uh, applauding. Uh, I encourage everybody now uh, to make their way to the chat box to um, type in their questions uh, for Paul. I'll take my uh, privilege as chair and ask the first one if that's all right. I think that was such a such an interesting um, perspective to give this kind of really sweeping history of of the cedars as something quite static as trees literally rooted into the ground and then from our perspective as people interested in travelers actually kind of viewing it from the perspective of yeah the, the trees and travelers sort of coming to them but in some cases you know travelers kind of trying to bring home seeds and and grow their own things like that i was just yeah. wondering with some of the the images that we looked at the paintings and the prints particularly leah do, do you think in terms of of genre these are ultimately landscape paintings or religious paintings or you know kind of are they supposed to be morally instructive I wonder I just wonder I think that the particularly visual images of, of the cedars I think have this really interesting kind of cross genre application well you're the art historian <laughs> <not me. laughs> well we could be we could be in conversation about it then <laughs> Well, I don't think uh, with Leah they're, they're, they're religious, um, uh, any, any sort of religious, fit into any religious type of painting genre really. Uh, they're sort of landscape, belong to landscapes I think, um, but, but a sort of special sort of landscape which focuses on an iconic image somehow. I mean, and, and if you look at the, some of the other pictures that, that I put up, you've got the cedars in their sort of context and, and the, the, the mountain, it's almost, the, the mountain seems to be the, the, the main thing and the cedars are almost stuck on in, in one or two of them, whereas with Lear, the, he's got, seems to be fascinated by the shape uh, and it's this the sort of you know, the branches, uh, you know, uh, um, sticking out horizontally, or almost horizontally, and it produces a very distinctive shape. I mean, it's very stylized, isn't it? Because when you look at actual photographs, actual pictures of the cedars today, very few of them look as, you know, geometrical as they often appear in paintings. And, um, so, you know, there's a sort of idealization of the shape. Um, at least that's what it seems to me. It, it's obviously, yeah, it's fascinating shape. Uh, I mean, you talked about people, travelers moving to the cedars. Of course, the last couple of images, you've got the cedars themselves are traveling. Uh, the cedars are the travelers. Mm. Uh, um, they're sort of, um, uh, the, the, their shape is is appearing elsewhere, um, but but I mean, having said that, I don't think religious imagery has got much relevance for Lear. It, it it's quite clear that one of the the sort of 
lasting attractions of the Cedars is their biblical association for a lot of people. Um, I've, you know, well, several clergymen we mentioned, or well, if not mentioned, there was um, several, yeah, Finney Fisk and, and Maundrell and so forth, clergymen went there. Uh, you've got this association of Cedarwood with the cross, the blue cross, uh, as well as with the Old Testament. So the biblical uh, associations in the 19th century are very much to the fore, I think. Mm. And of course, then people come along and debunk it like Burton. <laughs> you know, say it's all nonsense. And, uh, it's not a better tree at home. <laughs> 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 yeah fascinating yeah I, just, I think um yeah just because I was thinking as well because William Holman Hunt is Leah's teacher uh in, in his drawing and his painting so I, yeah I just kind of wondered yeah if there was not necessarily as I said I think I agree with you there's not necessarily a kind of um direct religious connotation um but certainly that Holman Hunt's interested in, in the landscape for its kind of religious you know significance and, and depth yeah that maybe Leah was kind of taking a page out of the the Holman Hunt book there in his depiction of Levantine landscape. Yes and, and I mean in the, that curious carol we had up I mean with the the cedars of Lebanon brought in to sort of I, I mean you know, what we're looking at is a scene in Bethlehem, which is, I mean, it's not actually very close. And um, a sort of geographical like, um, license here, uh, which, you know, it's, it's, people have this vague idea of the seats of Lebanon are sort of somewhere near Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And suddenly they've got something to do with the birth of Jesus, which, well, they haven't really. <laughs> Mm. Uh, we've got a question from Julie. Um, do you see a metaphor of the cedars with the overreaching quality of Rahman the merciful in the Islamic tradition? Sorry, can you say that again? Yeah, do you see a metaphor of the cedars with the overreaching quality of Rahman the merciful in the Islamic tradition? Well, I find that a bit Difficult as a question, really. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you, I mean, you and Julia. The, 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 the cedars, as, as we noted, they don't. Well, they don't occur in the old, the New Testament either, um, and they don't occur in the Quran, uh, which is not really perhaps surprising because, um, well, again, although Muhammad in his early days is supposed to have travelled as a merchant north to Syria and so on and therefore would not have been too far in from the area of the cedars. I mean, the cedars are not found in the Arabian Peninsula, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. I mean, this would be a real, real stretching a metaphor, I think. Um, no. Mm -hmm. the <laughs> well, there we go, nice and succinct. <laughs> I've never thought of that at all. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, another uh, a, a fact and then a question from John. Uh, Dr. Robert Uvedale, hope I got that pronunciation right, the 17th century botanist cottage is next to the grammar school in Enfield Town. Do you think the claim that the first Lebanese cedar tree planted in Europe was the one planted in the grounds of Enfield Palace in Enfield Town really true? Sadly, it was cut down by the council in 1920. <laughs> I, I can't answer that question. I'm afraid. <laughs> Pass on that one. I, I mean, the, the dates seem roughly right, don't they? Mm. I mean, I my paper did have a date on it. I can't. It's too complicated to go back and check it out. <laughs> but, um, I've, I've no knowledge of whether it's true. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Aileen's got a quite an interesting, uh, maybe. Um, proposition is that um we didn't mention the aroma but it's still important and sold i.e cedar balls to keep moths away uh maybe the ancients used the sap or aroma for medicinal purposes uh and that it helped its sanctity yeah, yeah that's interesting the kind of multi-sensory uh application of of the cedar as well yes i think that's absolutely right i mean mm. it was certainly used um well both in ritual religious um religious rituals as we've seen there's a couple of mentions of doesn't come up often in the old testament but it does come up as being used in in 
uh, religious rituals and, and medicinally. I mean, mm -hmm. it was used, yes, for quite possibly even still is for all I know. Um, yes, I, I think like most of these plants, um, I mean, when you start looking at herbals and related sort of literature, you find all sorts of things being used. Uh, so yes, the cedar was certainly used uh, medicinally. Mm. Yeah, something from Christina, which actually I had been thinking about as well. Um, to add, just to add a bit to today's situation, not Gilgamesh, not the Egyptians, um, but the last uh, put the last cedars in danger. But climate change. Um, there is a small organisation trying to save the trees in planting. Uh, sapling in higher areas where it is less hot in summer. Yeah, I wonder if you, if you felt that this paper was a sort of um, eco-critical, eco-historical sort of reading of, of travel history, maybe. Well, it is interesting that you do get um, hints when you start looking at the history that people were actually quite conscious of some of these ecological um, problems um, well before it sort of we, we tend to think, we tend to think of this as we've suddenly discovered uh, that we've got a problem, but actually people have discovered they got problems at various stages uh, quite early on. Um, you can see by the, by the Hadrian's markers, which appear to be an attempt to, you know, um, at least limit the damage that was being done to the forests. And the Maronites, um, monks or archbishop, you know, th uh, threatening excommunication on anybody that touched the cedars and they, they weren't entitled to. So people were conscious of this. Um, but today it obviously is, uh, I mean, more urgent and climate change. The general pattern seems to be, the you know, sort of prediction would be that cedars will migrate upwards as it were, or um, they, they don't flourish um, at lower. Uh, on, on the lower hills and as the temperatures increase um, they'll, they'll be driven mm. uh, to the higher um, places so I mean that is uh, yeah it, yeah so it, in some it, way it, those images will be a record of of when they could grow at a lower altitude which is which is quite interesting yeah I mean there's a lot of conservation work going on I mean not not only in Lebanon but I mean uh, well, I mean, in Ed Edinburgh. I mean, it helps obviously that cedars have been sort of regarded as icons for centuries, mm -hmm. uh, whereas some other species may just nobody really care about and they don't attract the same attention. They're the, they're the pandas of the plant world. <laughs> the pandas of the world. Okay. <laughs> get, get all the attention. We'll remember that as a quote. <laughs> pandas of the plant world. <laughs> and maybe I'm not going to do any better than that. So maybe we should uh, we should leave it there. Um, so that just leaves me um, to offer very, very grateful thanks to Paul for a, for a really interesting lecture and another Thursday evening um, well spent. I'll just advertise what we've got upcoming. It's actually the, the final lecture um, in our series uh, on Thursday, April 1st, so in a fortnight, um, from Dr. Gemma Masson, who will be talking about 18th century Istanbul, uh, so something to look forward to there, and information about tickets and all that stuff is in the same places as you found out about all the rest. Uh, we're also about to open registration um, for our postgraduate research competition. You'll get some more information um, about that in the coming week, and our call for papers for our online summer conference. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, not taking place in Bristol as we had hoped, but in the virtual world instead, which will be just as excellent. Call for Papers is now open for that, and we really warmly encourage our members or those who would like to become members um, to submit an abstract, I believe, before the, end, the deadline of April 30th. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Have a great evening and hope to see you in an event soon.